me just remind you a bit what was the point in my first lectures. And today I will actually give some proofs, not too many. So I hope not to get too technical, but still show you a little bit the flavor of all these things. But first I have to find my notes. So in the last lecture I talked, and then I told you essentially what was the point that well, if I start from the NLS equation and with a white chalk, so I start from the NLS equation, which I think of as a dynamical system, and so I write the Hamiltonian in the Fourier variables, which is squared plus. Bear with me, I will lose this notation very quickly. 2j. 2p plus 2. So you remember it was a nonlinear Schrodinger equation of uh, degree uh, 2p plus 1. And this was 2p plus 2. So the Hamiltonian has a nonlinearity of degree 2p plus 2. And then I have the uh, translation invariance that is encoded in the Fourier variables by saying that the sums of uh, these Fourier indexes uh, should be uh, zero when you take them with the correct signs. And let me remind you, so this is the NLS on T2 by my choice. So this Ji, the Fourier indexes, live in Z2. Okay? Z2. And this is nothing but the NLS Hamiltonian. Okay? Uh, P is an integer. OK, and then after uh, some discussion, we decided that, that we could pass to, to, we could do one step of Birkhoff normal form. And so instead of cha make a symplectic change of variables, that would send the Hamiltonian in this form here. So it's the same piece of degree two. <coughs> then here, I just have the resonances up to u bar. And here, not only I have the conservation of momentum, but I have this other condition, minus 1 to the i, ji mod square equal to 0, which represents Poisson commutation with this term here. Okay, And then I have a remainder, which is small. And remember, I told you I'm not going to be very precise on the function spaces, but if you want me to, I can be. And so I require that my sequence is in some h s, which is s larger than 1, OK? And small in this domain. This is a reasonable I hypothesis. And uh, so still to, to make everything completely, to, to just remind you other things, my point was to find special solutions. And today I will concentrate uh, on one of the two types of special solutions that I was proposing to study, which is uh, the quasi-periodic solutions. So these are solutions that are recursive. Uh, and you start with an initial datum in HS, and it's small in HS. And this initial datum will stay small in HS for all times. They're global solutions. Okay. And uh, so the point was that I can first preliminarily just study this piece here. And this uh, is uh, um, the resonant, it's the Birkhoff normal form Hamiltonian. Or if you want, since uh, this piece here and this piece here, Poisson commute, you can really just study this Hamiltonian, which I will write in red because this is what I will study for the rest of my talk. It's the resonant Hamiltonian which is the piece of a degree j2p plus 2. I said I would lose the notation, but I will have to. j i equals 0, minus 1 to the i, j i squared equals 0. OK? This is the thing that I'm going to study. And to make connections with the, lessons, with the talks of Professor Fosade, this, uh, if you take p equal to 1, is exactly the Hamiltonian of the resonance system that he was talking about. Except that naturally, since I am not working on T2 times R, I'm working just on T2, I cannot say that I have an, a limit to 
to solutions of the systems. I, uh, I will have to first study the solutions of the systems, and then if I want to find from this system information on the true Hamiltonian, I will have to give either have just a finite time result, or I will have to do some serious perturbation theory. And in fact, once I have studied the solutions of these systems, I will do a KM theorem to, pro to uh, prove uh, that from, uh, so from certain types of solutions here, I can deduce uh, the existence of corresponding solutions for the full NLS. So it will not. But still, this system has a very rich dynamics and it's a very interesting. And no, I think I'll take this down. But in order to uh, avoid having two horrible notations, I need to give some definitions. And here they are. So I will. A vector j will be a 2p plus 2 pl. I don't know if the word is English, but j3 up to j 2p plus 2. Okay, and the ji's are in z2. Okay, and then let me remind you that I will denote by mj the monomial written there. So it's uj1, u bar j2 up to u bar j 2p plus 2. So I, and then I need to define these conditions here. So what is a resonance? So I will say that j is a resonance. And I should say it's a resonance of degree 2p plus 2, but I will systematically omit this. If sum minus 1 to the i j i is equal to 0, and sum minus 1 to the i j i squared is equal to 0. And then I will say that j is a trivial resonance if uh, I take the unordered list of uh, the odd indexes, so j1, j3 up to j 2p plus 1, and this, as an unordered sequence, is equal to the even modes j2, j4, up to j2p plus 2. And we saw last time that these are special resonances. They always occur, no matter what the equation. And the point is that if you just look at trivial resonances, then the corresponding resonant Hamiltonian is integrable, and it preserves the linear modes. So uh, all the interesting dynamics is given by the non-trivial resonances. So here I have. Uh, a nicer form for uh, my resonant Hamiltonian. So I say it's the sum over the resonances of mj. It's decidedly more compact notation. I think I can send this up. Uh, well, even if I couldn't, now it's done. <laughs> Supposed to work like that? Can, can somebody read what is written there? Yes, oh, OK. <laughs> it's good. I, I can't read nothing, but I will point. No, you are the only one who can yeah. read. <laughs> OK. So what did I want to prove? I want to prove the following fact. So I wanted to prove. So let me get you to the point where I was. Now I want to study that resonant Hamiltonian, and I want to show that there are many choices of finite sets, which I call S, which are sets made of V1, Vn, and Yn, with the Vi are in Z2. And I want to show that for many choices of these sets, I have uh, that these Fourier supports are invariant for the resonant dynamics, which is written up in top there. Okay? So there exists, what was my statement? There exists a polynomial of uh, n complex variables within C2, such that if this polynomial computed at my tangential sites is different from 0, then the following holds. 1. So I'll write, and then I'll explain. Such that uj is 0 if j is in z2 minus s. So 
This set in which all the Fourier modes are purely concentrated on the set S, because I'm placing uj equal to zero if j does not belong to the set S, and I'm calling the complementary S complementary, just to have a note. So this set is invariant. And two, if I compute the resonant Hamiltonian restricted to this set, then I get just the sum over the trivial resonances. OK? So these are two statements. The first statement is saying that for the resonant dynamics, I have a finite dimensional invariant manifold. And the second statement is telling me essentially that the dynamics on this manifold is integrable and simple. OK? So. How do you prove something? And uh, you remember last time I told you uh, this was true for generic choices of S. And now I can make this genericity ex more explicit because I can produce a polynomial with variables in C2. And these facts are true provided that this explicitly defined polynomial is different from zero. So I just have to tell you what the polynomial is. So how does one go on to, uh, to perform a proof uh, that uh, uh, finite uh, sup uh, Fourier support is an invariant manifold for a Hamiltonian. Well, this is completely trivial. You just take your Fourier modes and you divide them in two sets. One are the Fourier modes in S, and the others are the all the other ones. Okay. And then I take my resonant Hamiltonian and I decompose it in increasing degrees in the normal variables. Okay? So I will have a piece, so HRES is made by a sum over the resonances and the number of JIs in S complementary is zero. So all these numbers here are in S. And this is mj. Then I have a term which is linear in the normal variables. I'm calling these variables here the normal variables, because naturally I'm looking for an invariant subspace supported here. And all these directions are normal directions to my invariant subspace. Okay. And so I, I keep going with my uh, Taylor expansion. These are the terms which have one mode in S complementary of degree 1. Plus, and so forth. So here I have that the number of Ji's, ah, can I just, is larger or equal than 2. So the number of Ji's in S complementary is larger or equal than 2. Now, and you can do this for any Hamiltonian in any setting. It's, it's just the same uh, kind of reasoning in the same way. So what do I have to do? I have to compute the Hamiltonian vector field of this Hamiltonian. And I have to show that when I compute it on the normal variables equal to 0, it has to be tangent to my invariant subspace, so to the finite dimensional subspace. So I have to make the derivative of h res with respect to the normal variables. Well, naturally, this does not depend on the normal variables, so it gives 0. This term here has degree at least 2 in the normal variables. So when you do the derivative and compute at the normal variables equal to 0, it gives zero. So my whole point to prove that something is invariant is to show that the linear terms in the normal variables are zero. Because here it's, everything is uh, flat. It's an extremely simple computation. But now here you see, it's true that when I write these monomials, sometimes there are repetitions. So I'm writing the same thing many times. But the coefficient is always 1. So the only way in which this sum can be zero is uh, that this set here is empty. OK? So what do I have to prove? So my point 1 is equivalent to showing that the j's in the resonance such that the number of ji in S complementary is 1. This is a set of 2p plus 2 plus. This should be empty.
Okay. And what about point two? Well, uh, once I have imposed this, then the US is invariant. And to know this dynamics here, I just have to look at this piece here. And so what I'm saying is that if I have uh, resonance and uh, all the Ji's are, let me use the same notation, the number of Ji's in S complementary is zero, so everything is in S, then J is a trivial resonance. Okay? If it's a resonance, everything is in S, then it is trivial. So uh, at this point I'm done because uh, to now I have to produce my polynomial and this is extremely simple. So let me do it in the case P equal 1, which has very nice geometric uh, meaning. So in P equal 1, remember, so I have that J is a quartuple, J2, J3, J4. The resonance sets are made like this. You have rectangles, J1, J2, J3, J4. Okay, these are the resonance sets. And the trivial resonances are these. This is trivial resonances. Okay, this would be J1 equal J2, J3 equal J4, or whatever. And these are all together. Okay? So what? is my polynomial. My polynomial is simple. Xn, you just take the product over all triples, i different from L, different from K. And these are numbers going from 1 to n. And then I just take the scalar product, xi minus xl, xk minus xl. So I claim that this is the generative polynomial for the cubic case. And this is trivial. What does it mean that this polynomial is not zero? This polynomial is not zero means that if you choose any three points, they will not form a right angle. Okay? So if I have, say, vi, vl, and vk, place like this, so this is a right angle, then this polynomial is zero. And by my ansatz, genericity means that the polynomial is zero. So I'm choosing my set in such a way that it is never true that they form a rectangle. But then it's obvious that my first point is telling me that, uh, resonance, that, that the resonances with just one point outside of S is empty. Because what is a resonance? with just one point outside of S. Well, it's made like this, let's say. But this is not possible because then the polynomial is zero. Or otherwise, it could be a trivial resonance. But if you see trivial resonance, it means that all the points have multiplicity at less two. And so I cannot have one point, just one point outside of us. So it's quite clear. So you see, it's nothing particularly uh, strange. It's just a very explicit polynomial, and uh, the first condition is satisfied. So why that is the second condition satisfied? Well, this is, again, pretty simple, because, well, this would be vi, vl, vk, and then I'm saying that I have another point, v whatever, and they form a non-trivial resonance. Okay, this means that there is a rectangle. It all ends here. So I guess also I, I must say that probably in this notation, it's so evident that you don't really need to say things like this. You can try to add points by induction. So you might think I get a set S with uh, n points, which uh, uh, satisfies all my conditions. And I just want to add one point in such a way that the conditions of being invariant and being trivial are still satisfied. Well, this is a very easy game to play, and you do not need to produce polynomials. But maybe this is a formal way of saying things, and when things get harder, uh, it's useful. Okay? It's, uh, so, uh, 20 minutes, maybe I'll very quickly give you an idea 
of what happens in the general case. Uh, in the general case, you just have to be a little bit more formal. Obviously, everything, I, I have to prove that this set is empty. Okay? What does this mean? This means that I could suppose from my, uh, up there, 2p plus tuple, I can suppose that the first 2p plus 1 points are in S, and the last one is possibly outside. Okay? But this means that J1, J3, all these points there are in S, so they are either V1 or V2 or V3 or one of the Vs. So I can rephrase the resonance condition instead of writing it as in the second to last line, I can write it like this. I have a sum over the Vi's, and I now is going from 1 to n, but I don't know that the coefficient is 1, so I'm just calling this lambda i. And this has to be equal to j to p plus 2. And then the same condition with the same coefficients is for the mod squareds. Okay? And this is just a rephrasing of that where I'm taking into account multiplicity. And you can notice that these lambda i's are a finite number because I know that the sum of the lambda i's must be 1, so lambda cannot be 0 in particular. And then the sum of the moduli of the lambda i must be smaller or equal than 2p plus 2, p plus 1, sorry. Okay, so this is a finite set. But then, what does it mean that a resonance occurs? Well, a resonance occurs with a certain lambda. If this polynomial, which I call p lambda of x1, xn, is 0. And the polynomial is just, I take this, I substitute here. Okay? So it's just sum lambda i vi squared minus, this is the mod, lambda i vi squared. Okay? But you can see that if lambda has n does not have support 1, so if it has at least two different entries, uh, then this polynomial is not trivially 0. And I can certainly, uh, sorry, I wrote v instead of x. And so I can certainly ask that this polynomial is not 0 computed at the vi's. And then I avoid the resonance. On the other hand, if this lambda has support 1, so it's just 1, say, v1, then I'm saying that j to p plus 2 is equal to v1, so everything in, is inside of s. I mean, you have to go to grow, I'm going to the proof a little bit fast, but you can convince yourself that the polynomial that I'm looking for is the product of these polynomials here over all the possible lambdas. And it just take you five minutes to check the proof completely. So again, it's totally explicit. And at this point, I have my claim. So one can go back a little bit and just try to see what does this mean. Um, I can erase here. because What does it mean that I have an invariant subspace for the resonant Hamiltonian and that the dynamic is trivial? Well, the invariance of space, the dynamics trivial, means that I have produced a number of Fourier supports, S, on which all the dynamics is given on Torai. Because this dynamic here, which I will study in a moment, is a dynamics which lives only on Torai. It's purely integrable and it's trivial. An interesting point which I would like to make, but I, I cannot really pull the argument through to the real NLS, is that in fact I could play this game also with infinite sets of S. In fact, I mean, what I would get, think of the cubic case, I would not get a polynomial because I get an infinite product. But still, if you try to mm, see how many points are such that uh, uh, the US is invariant, most of the infinite sequences work. Because the only thing that you need for an infinite sequence of points s, so just place them, I, I cannot place infinite ones, but the only thing you need is that you never have uh, right angles between any triple. And it's irrelevant, the fact that you have a, product, a finite product of polynomials, so a polynomial or an infinite set series of products. It's uh, exactly the same thing. But the problem with this is that, in fact, I'm not able from these solutions, which clearly exist, to produce solutions of the true NLS. 
So I don't know what to do with this. It's true, but I don't know what to do with it. So let us study the dynamics on the invariance of space. So, well, just with a little bit of computations, you see that you get this system here. So you have the sum over the alphas in n to the number of tangential frequencies. Modulus of alpha is more than or equal than p plus 1. And then I have the product. Sorry, I have to first write and then explain. OK? This is the explicit expression of the resonance Hamiltonian computed on a set in which you only have trivial resonances. You just have to do the combinatorics. This is a multinomial coefficient. Okay? And then, uh, well, this means that essentially I know everything about this function because I can pass to action angle variables. Let me do it in a symplectic way. These are the standard action angle variables associated to a complex structure. And then this Hamiltonian, for, for some reasons in our paper we called it A, the only thing that it depends on is the actions, because it's integrable, and it depends only on the degree. It uh, does not have any relation on where uh, S is supported. So it's, and it's just this expression here, plus 1 alpha squared i e to the alpha e. Okay? Well, I'm not claiming that this is simple. It's not really true, but uh, you can certainly compute the dynamics of this system. And the dynamics of this system is always i dot equal to 0 for all i's. And then I have that theta i dot is just the derivative of a p of i with respect to i i. So it's a constant. And this is typically called the i-th frequency. Also, if you take the simplest case, which would be the cubic NLS, then this is really a simple thing to write down. So let me write it. A1 is just the sum of i i squared plus 4 i smaller than k i i i k. Hoping that I didn't get anything wrong. But it should be this. OK? So you just compute uh, the Hamiltonian. You can compute the frequencies. And you know everything. But the interesting thing is that the map, that maps i into the set of frequencies, omega i, so this lives in Rn, and this lives in Rn. This map is generically a diffeomorphism. And well, for uh, A1, this is trivial. It's a linear map. You just compute the determinant. It's obvious. But in general, you can see that the degree of A of P grows with P. And so this becomes harder and harder to prove. But you can find a proof uh, in the paper with my father on CMP. And you can find another proof with slightly different notations, but it works exactly the same in the paper by Wemin Bank. Because this. And this, well, if one has experience with KN theory, this is uh, a very important fact. This is called the fact that your unperturbed system has a twist. But the point is uh, that in this way, when you move the initial data, you move the frequency. And so if when you do your uh, small divisor problems, which you would have to do in order to do a KN theorem, if you get at some point that some frequency provides a divergence in your perturbative scheme, then you just move the action a little bit and you change the frequency. And this is what you're going to use it. And in fact, you can envision much weaker conditions than this that. is very strong. But here we have this. And so you do not have to think more. OK? 
Well, at this point, it seems to me that uh, some questions arise naturally, just uh, without even looking at the NLS Hamiltonian. I mean, uh, and in fact, when I started to get interested in this problem, and in particular when I got my father, who is an algebraist, interested in this problem, I never talked about the NLS Hamiltonian to him. I just posed a question of saying, OK, so by modulating the set S, what is the best possible scenario that I can get in the sets of resonances? So you see here, the best possible scenario, if you just look at the resonances restricted all to S, or the resonances which have just one point in S, is extremely simple. This set is empty, this set is trivial. But let's say that you want to go further, and you want to go and look at the sets where the number of Ji in S complementary is 2. What can you say? by moving the points vi. So this is a question uh, for, uh, uh, which has nothing to do with the NLS, and it can be posed, and uh, that's what we asked ourselves. So we actually never looked at the dynamics for a long while, but only uh, on the for uh, the geometry. But uh, since here I really would like to justify why I'm doing things, except from the fact that I like the problem, what is the interest in studying the second piece. So I have at this point proved that my HRS is given by the Hamiltonian, which is integrable, restricted to US. Then the linear piece is 0, so I don't write it. And then I have a quadratic piece. I'm just avoiding number of Ji's in S complementary. This is just, uh, and then I get all the others. Okay, what is the meaning of this piece here? Well, I have proved that I have an invariant torus, so. in which the uj's are 0 for all j in S complementary. The ii's are constant, and the theta i move as omega i of i times t, plus a phase, which is irrelevant. OK? So this piece here has the following meaning. So this piece here gives me the linear stability of this solution, which is a solution of the resonant Hamiltonian, inside the resonant Hamiltonian. So if I could say that uh, this, this is a quadratic form in the uh, normal variables, because it has degree 2 in the normal variables. So if I could say that this is a stable quadratic Hamiltonian, I would have linear stability of my solutions in, in the resonant system. If it's unstable, and I can show you unstable directions, then it's unstable. The point is that when you compute this, this is rather complicated because uh, it depends on the angles. It's, infinite, it's an infinite dimensional matrix, uh, and I have to find a way to describe it. Otherwise, it's not clear to me what I can say about stability. Okay? And uh, the simpler is the set of res resonances on which I support my sum, the simpler is this matrix. So it stands to reason that if I try to simplify this set as much as possible, I can gain information on the linear stability of the NLS Hamiltonian. And then, uh, let me go even a step further. Once I have this resonant Hamiltonian, I can plug it in above there in my NLS Hamiltonian written after one step of Birkhoff normal form. So I could add my perturbation of degree uh, 4p plus 2. And then, uh, it's not a trivial argument. It's, in fact, the basis of Eliasson and Cookson paper on the NLS on T2. But you can prove that if you have linear stability of this piece here, so the resonant Hamiltonian, then when you add the small perturbation p for p, uh, of degree 4p plus 2, everything sti is still stable. Okay, so I really can prove existence and linear stability for the solutions on top of the NLS, so for the true NLS equation. So it, it is a reasonable question to ask oneself. It's not just uh, uh, trying to play 
with numbers. But unfortunately, so uh, what would I like? So the best possible thing that I would like, but unfortunately it's not true, is that if this uh, set here looks exactly like uh, the set with the, all the sites on US. So the best thing that I could ask is that the only resonances here are trivial. I can also ask that resonances are empty. So let me, I have J in res, the number of Ji in S complementary is two. So there are always trivial resonances like this. You take V1, V1, repeat it as many times as you want and then you have J and J. This is a trivial resonance. This is a point in S complementary, let's say. Well, I, it's useless that I repeat it twice. So this is a trivial resonance and it's always there. I cannot avoid anything like this, okay? So trivial resonances are there and uh, there is uh, nothing I can do except that, well, since no, you can do bookkeeping, so I can write explicitly what is the expression of the Hamiltonian restricted to the trivial resonances. It's just extremely boring. So it's all the alpha in n to the n, well, alpha is equal to p, and then I have something like this. p over alpha squared, i to the alpha, our product. S okay, so the sum of the trivial resonances, it's not particularly enlightening, but it's explicit. And then I am left with the non trivial. Now, the nice thing is that if this were zero, I would be able to do KM theory taking this Hamiltonian as an unperturbed system because uh, it would fit exactly in the hypothesis uh, of the KM theorem by Cooksing and Eliasson who discussed exactly the NLS Hamiltonian but they added external parameters. And then I would have external parameters which would be these actions here, well they're internal but I have parameters and I can check that everything fits in their uh, hypothesis. The problem is that unfortunately it's completely true, that it's completely false that this piece is empty. And uh, at this point I'm not going to make any pictures in the non-cubic case because they're quite hard to draw, but in the cubic case this is completely obvious because I take Vi, I take Vj, and then I have to form a rectangle with these two points. Ah, uh, well, I have these two lines and all the integer points on these two lines form a rectangle. So if you take here h, if you take here k, this is the two lines uh, perpendicular, yes, perpendicular to the uh, line that uh, joins the two tangential sides, okay? And then clearly this is a right angle and so this is a rectangle and this is unavoidable. And if you think about it, these two lines, they have uh, equations with integer coefficients, so they always have infinitely many integer points. So uh, it's clearly evident that the set of non-trivial resonances is not empty. The best thing that I can do is try to classify them. I cannot hope to avoid them. Also, I have another way of forming rectangles because I can form a rectangle by uh, taking uh, Vi and Vj as the diagonal, the, no, I don't know the word, as uh, the line center of the circle, okay? So, <laughs> yes, the diagonal, it's great. So this is H and this is a right angle, okay? And uh, well, these are circles. I have very few integer points on them. But if you think about it, if you want to have many points S, then you cannot really avoid having some integer points here. Okay? So we really do have uh, this situation and this is uh, the best you can do. So you can ask yourself, okay, let's see, how do I classify things like this? Well, 
I can ask, for instance, that uh, <coughs> a point forms uh, as uh, low number of resonances as possible. So, for instance, if uh, my set S is made just of these two points here, then what is my situation? I will have uh, well, most points, here you have Z2 inside here, so most points in Z2 will not be in any resonance relation, and then I will have uh, all the integer points, which are infinitely many, but uh, relatively few, on these two lines or on these circles, and they will have one resonance. Okay? But you see that this uh, very nice thing fails when you start adding points, because, uh, okay, let me add, uh, it's useless that I give random numbers. This is V1, this is V2, and so maybe I add two points, V3 and V4. And maybe I even forget to draw the circles, because maybe I can avoid intersections of circles, but certainly two lines in R2 generically intersect. And so I have this point here, let me call this H, and this point here belongs to two resonance sets. Okay? And uh, again, I cannot even, I, I can move my uh, tangential side, so my points VI, as much as I want. But I cannot really avoid this unless I put them all parallel, but this is really looking for a one-dimensional solution inside a two-dimensional space, so I really do not like this. Okay? So generically, these points will intersect. So if you just think of this as a problem of intersection of lines, well, maybe the best thing that you can avoid, that you can do, is you can try to avoid the triple intersection. So maybe I would not like to add a point to V5 in such a way that I have these two lines and they intersect here, with also with V5 and also with the line coming from V2. This I might hope to avoid, because a triple intersection in lines should be non-generic. Okay? But still, in fact, you have to be careful, because I cheated. I uh, used uh, um, five points to make a triple intersection. But in fact, you have to draw two lines and a circle for every couple of uh, tangential sites. So in fact, I could try to produce uh, triple intersections which must less points. And uh, it's not a completely trivial question. Here it's obvious, right? I move V5 a little bit and I get out of the triple intersection. So <laughs> we, we had this example which uh, is rather stupid, but I like it because it shows that you should be really careful. So here, I want to avoid the triple intersections between figures made like this. Okay? I have my two points, I move my two points, and this moves these pictures here. So suppose, instead of having this picture, that you have V1, V2, and instead of this figure, I make a simpler figure. I take the axis. Okay? Well, can I ask that if I move the points and then I look at these axis lines, I avoid triple intersections? No. Because you have a triangle, V1, V2, V3. And then if you take the axis, the triple intersection is the center, is the in centrum? I, I don't know the word in English. Let me make the picture better so you understand. You take three points. And for every couple of lines, you take the axis. Obviously you cannot avoid the triple intersection, okay? So, in fact, these lines are very similar. And, uh, and so you have to be careful because, uh, you see, I, I perturb the problem a little bit. I look at the axis instead of this picture, and if I try, I'm, I'm risking of saying totally false things. And in fact, what you can prove is not that you cannot have triple intersections. You have this statement here. There exists a polynomial in x1, 
xn, such that if you compute your polynomial at v and it's different from 0, then I'll write it and then I'll explain. So my triple intersections do occur. Actually, there are multiple intersections. But the, intersection the multiple intersection points are the vi, vjs themselves. And there are no multiple intersections except from these special points. You see, because the incentrum game gets translated, and it becomes that you have multiple intersections at these special points. But I don't really care of multiple intersections in these special points, because the only thing I want to know is the set of resonances where I have two points outside. So I'm only really interested in intersections with an outside point. OK? So this is what you can prove in dimension 2. OK? And what does this mean? This means So how do you restate this? You restate that, that if j, so for all points h in z2 minus s, so it's s complementary, there exist at most two resonances. which are non-trivial, obviously. Otherwise, this becomes a stupid statement, such that h is the last point of the resonance. And obviously, I have to be careful of multiplicity, because I, I have lots of groups of permutations which keep the resonance in itself. So I have to be a little bit careful of what I do. And once you have this, you can, in fact, prove KM theory. But before I go into the KM theory, I would like to show you, uh, what you that you can, in fact, do be even better than this. OK? So this is a statement in uh, the uh, spirit of my first statement. I produced a polynomial which made the uh, first two terms of the degree expansion in the normal variable simple. And then I produced a third po another polynomial. It's not ex the same polynomial. I just wrote with the same letter. That uh, makes uh, the term of degree 2 as simple as possible. Because for each uh, normal site, I have at most two resonances which contain it, which means that I can describe the matrix pretty, f pretty uh, in, a, in an explicit way. So, with polynomials, we are not able to do anything better. But uh, in fact, uh, the starting point for the results uh, on NLS uh, on T2 was not via the principle of constructing a genericity polynomial, but it was uh, an idea by Gang Yu and Shu, which I find extremely nice and which uh, gives you the, really the best possible thing that you can hope. So what didn't I use in this picture? It's true that if you have two lines, generically they intersect. This is just a fact. But uh, here, I never drew the fact that I'm only interested in integer points. I don't really care if this intersection is not an integer, because it will not appear in my resonance formula. It's the resonance are integer vectors. So what was Gang Yu and Shu's ideas? They tried to move uh, the tangential sites uh, and to see that you could produce tangential sites such that none of the intersection points are integer. Okay? Maybe with the circles, you can hope to even avoid that the intersection points are real. But with the lines, intersection points occur. And the best thing that you can do is say, let's hope it's not an integer. 
The problem of their proof, uh, so I don't think you can do it by a polynomial because it's a very different kind of proposition, right? It's, you're not saying that something, this is a geometric statement that three points do not intersect. While two points are integer, uh, one single point is integer, this is an, an arithmetic statement. But uh, the point is that they really did it by hand. So they took their set and they tried to prove by induction that if you have a set with endpoints, which uh, has your uh, intersection property, then you can add another point and it still has the intersection property. But uh, the proof was very heavy and uh, it could not be pulled through to uh, any degree NLS. So it, it works only for p equal one. And also, it really works only in dimension one. Because, uh, so let, let me try to give you an image of what this looks like in T3. You are in Z3, so I have an extra direction. And uh, instead of having resonant lines, I have resonant planes. You can imagine that the planes are coming out, and this is a section. And instead of resonant circles, I have resonant spheres. But then, generically, two planes intersect in a line, and three planes intersect in a point. And so I cannot really hope to avoid any uh, triple intersections. I can avoid quadruple intersections, and so <laughs> it becomes more and more complicated. You have to be careful. But in fact, if you just stick to dimension two, this works extremely nice. So, I cannot say there exists a polynomial, but I can say that there exist infinitely many S in whatever finite number of points you want, such that there exist at most one. such that h is equal to the last point. Okay? This is true for any p, but just in dimension 2. And then, uh, uh, Gengyu and Xu's argument was uh, that from this uh, scenario here, you can do KM theory. You cannot really apply uh, any known KM theorem directly, but you can still perform KM theory. Uh, what I would like to tell you is uh, a slightly different presentation from theirs. So I would like to tell you what, uh, in uh, the notations that we developed for uh, higher dimensions, we could do with a scenario like this because I think it is interesting. And so how you catch up to a KM theorem once you have this. Because, you see, it might seem not so worthwhile to go through all this trouble just to have one resonance instead of two. I mean, what do you care? Uh, well, the things, unfortunately, change uh, dramatically. So, and uh, the point is this. So suppose that you're in this setting here, then uh, what uh, I'll write here, okay? And I think I have to take my notes. Okay, so I am. So now, just this is a question of tastes, but instead of writing my statement for the resonant Hamiltonian, I will write it for the full NLS Hamiltonian in the variable. So I will add my perturbation. This is because uh, we're used to thinking about uh, doing, uh, well, I'm, I'm used to thinking about KM schemes, and so I want to see the perturbation really there. I want to see the piece which is the H1 norm really there. But. This is just possibly a question of tastes. So 
what I say that under the hypothesis for S as before, oops. So the case in just one resonance, then there exist symplectic variables. And when I say they exist, I mean that I know what they are. I can write them down. It's just that I want to avoid this and spare you at least this. Such that in these variables, here is my NLS Hamiltonian. I have the piece which is the H1 norm, which is not touched. So I just write it in my variables. This is the piece on S. And this is the piece outside. So this would be my linear dynamics. Nothing, I've said nothing. Then I have the correction coming from uh, the trivial resonances all restricted to S, so my integrable piece. And then here is what the quadratic form looks like after a simple change of variables under that hypothesis there. I have things like this. Uj squared sum uj plus, uh, I'll comment later, plus. So these are all accounted for. These are, are the terms of degree at least three in the normal variables, which I can ignore because they are small in my notation. This is the perturbation coming from uh, the Birkhoff normal form. And the point is that I can produce uh, symplectic variables in which the Hamiltonian has this form here. So I have, redu I have completely diagonalized the normal variables and uh, I have some new corrections of eigenvalues. Well, this means uh, that the system is stable. So in fact, I am cheating because I have to add that there exist symplectic variables and there exist values of i of the actions. So I have symplectic variables and an open set of the actions i such that the NLS Hamiltonian is stable at these i's and uh, I have an explicit form for uh, these coefficients here. And in fact, I have the complementary result. I also have regions of the actions in which this form is exactly the same, but instead of having in standard canonical stable form, I have standard canonical unstable form, okay? So this new sum also bears an S complement. Yes, yes. sorry. Yes. And so, well, in fact, so there are various comments in order. This result we can prove, but with uh, uh, lots and lots of effort, for the cubic NLS in any degree. And we can prove uh, for uh, uh, the non-cubic NLS in dimension 2, even without requiring uh, this uh, very strong condition, even by just requiring that you're not on the zeros of a polynomial. What is the strong difference? The strong difference is that here, oops, well, <laughs> I'll do what I can. I know these functions. Okay, these uh, are uh, uh, the zeros of certain completely explicit quadratic polynomials. Okay, so the mu i are solutions. I have t squared plus some known function of i, depending on j, times t plus some term equal to zero. And it's the zeros of these very explicit polynomials. When I go to degree higher, so if I go to a higher dimensional terai, so in dimension three, 
or if uh, I give up on this condition and just use polynomials, uh, I still can say that uh, these correction functions, I can compute them, but unfortunately, they are zeros of polynomials of higher degree. So I, I can say that they exist, I can describe them, but I cannot really write them down. And uh, in uh, doing KM theorems, uh, knowing uh, the structure of these frequencies is extremely important. And so really the fact that if I add these conditions, I can compute this, is not something that you should give up easily. But unfortunately, it works only in dimension two. Okay? So I have 15 minutes, so I would like to write just uh, for curiosity for you, what are the kinds of conditions that one needs in order to perform a KM scheme, so that you see why I'm saying I really want to know these conditions. And then maybe give you a very quick sketch of, uh, <laughs> of the proof of the thing that I just uh, cancelled. So of the fact that in fact you can uh, avoid that these intersection points are integer. And it's in the cubic case, it's a rather easy proof. In the non-cubic, it's hard, so I'm not even going to attempt. So most KM schemes start with a Hamiltonian like this. Okay? The KM schemes rely on the fact that you have a number of parameters, and the parameters here are the actions, and then they rely on the fact that you can impose what are called the Melnikov conditions. I'm going to just write them for you, but the Melnikov conditions have, uh, uh, in fact, a meaning. The meaning of the Melnikov condition is that if you look at this Hamiltonian here, so the piece that you consider your unperturbed Hamiltonian, and you compute the adjoint action of this Hamiltonian over the space of, um, of Hamiltonians, this will give you a matrix, and the Melnikov conditions are requiring that this matrix is regular semi-simple, so it has distinct eigenvalues. But typically, you just write the Melnikov conditions because they are very explicit. And uh, that's what I will do. So let me remind you that omega of i is the derivative with respect to i, i, of the function a, p of i. OK? This is just a notation, and this is the frequency of uh, my twisted torus. So the Melnikov conditions say that and then I need another definition, sorry, square plus omega i of i. So this is another vector, so lambda lives in Rn. And what I want is the lambda scalar product with any integer vectors in Zn plus a squared plus mu h of i. This is a function of i. Plus or minus k squared plus mu k of i is not identically zero. And for what? For all l in Zn h and k in z2. So this is infinitely many conditions. Let's just look at this. These are infinitely many analytic functions of i. Okay? In fact, they're algebraic functions of i. These uh, I just computed out of a polynomial. And the mu k's, you just have to take me on trust that they are algebraic functions. Well, they are zeros of polynomials in the i variables. So it's quite true. Okay? So what I want is uh, that all of these combinations do not give zero. So this uh, I am taking 
lambda of i dot l, so this is a function of i, then I have uh, corrections between two of these and I want this never to be identically zero. So if you think about it, the simplest possible thing would be if these were zero. If these are zero, then everything uh, just follows from the fact that this map here is a one-to-one -one map from action space to frequency space. But even if this did not depend on the actions, I would be perfectly happy. The point is that you can see that these functions here could cancel with lambda of i. So it might be possible that if you just these numbers, h squared, k squared, could cancel with these numbers here, which are integers, and then the functions of i, they could cancel, and this could be identically zero. And you have to avoid this. Once you avoid this situation, then you can plug in a KM theorem, and you have good hopes of pulling the KM theorem through. But if you do not have this condition, then you have to go through some serious trouble in trying to do perturbation theory on a Hamiltonian of this form. Okay? Don't you need any kind of estimate from below? Yes, but uh, in but fact that, that comes automatically from the analyticity and from the fact that this is a diffeomorphism. Because if L is big, this is trivial. It's, you, you can really play with this and uh, you only need uh, non-identically zero. But it's the point. So, well, obviously, if I can compute these functions, uh, I just plug everything in and I check if it's zero or not. And in particular, since this is a polynomial in the eyes uh, and these are solutions of quadratic expressions, if I get square roots and the square roots are non-trivial, it becomes very easy to show that this is not identically zero. But uh, if uh, even if it's degree 3, as soon as I'm not able to compute, I really have to get some nice ideas in order to prove that this cannot be 0. Even in a very stupid case, say like L is equal to 0, mod H squared is equal to mod K squared, so these cancels, and I have to show that I do not have a double occurrence, mu H equal to mu K. It's not easy to prove, it's, it's quite hard. Okay, so, and that's why I'm saying I really like this setting. I mean, you can do it. In the cubic NLS, we were able to prove for any dimension, knowing almost nothing about this mu p, except that they were solutions of polynomials of, the, of degree, the dimension, we were able to prove these conditions. But you really have to work hard. Instead here, you compute. And this is why I like it. So, how are we with time? I really, maybe... Seven minutes? Ah, okay, no, seven minutes are perfectly <laughs> fine. <laughs> no, no I, I realized this was <laughs> very technical, so I just didn't want to keep killing you for other ten minutes, but, oh uh, well. <laughs> you gave me permission. So how do you go about proving that an intersection point like this is not an integer? Well, as uh, I gave you in the example which I raised of the uh, triple intersections, things become easier if uh, I have an intersection point coming from like V1 and V2 and V3 and V4. So these two points and these two points do not look do not uh, have any intersection. So it's harder if I have just say v1, v2, and v3, and then I have to make an intersection point. It's harder to prove results, so uh, let's see if I can say it in a human way. The v1, v these points here are your variables, and you want to move them in order to avoid some uh, bad behavior. The more variables you have, the more degrees of freedom you have to move, and the simpler is the result to get. The less the variables you have, the harder. Okay, so I'm just going to go on a hard case. Because if you have to give an example, give an trivial one. So I want, I have a point X, which is in an intersection. So what does it mean that X is in an intersection? I will uh, do this example here. 
I, I had two examples written, and so maybe the most instructive uh, is uh, the two lines example. So what does it mean that x belongs to this line here? It means that x minus v2 against v1 minus v2, this is a scalar product, is 0. Okay. What does it mean that x belongs to an extra, another condition? Well, x minus, I have to choose what to write here. If I put here v2, then uh, this is trivial. Say I write something like this. Then the solution of this system is v2 itself. So this is not an intersection point, which is interesting. I want to get intersection points outside of my set S. If I put here v1, then I would be making the intersection of parallel lines, and this is not interesting. So this is an interesting case. Okay? This is an intersection between two lines. And I want to choose v1, v2, v3, so that x does not belong to z2. Okay. So let me start by making the ansatz that the vi's are inside some box. Okay. It's completely useless that I add other tangential sites. I can think that there are three tangential sites and just do it for this. Okay, but then if you do Kramer and just use the fact that these are all integer relations, you will see that x exists and it is inside some ball of radius r as well, because uh, these are integer lines, so they cannot be too parallel if uh, the vi's are smaller than r. So what do I want to say? I want to say that inside of this box here, I can remove a few points and avoid that x is integer. This is the game that I want to play. Okay, so how do I do this? Well, so this proof was written by my father and I claim no responsibility for the notation. So he said, but it's nice, but maybe it's a little bit formal to, for my taste. So consider the map that associates to these points the quadruple, v1, v2, v3, and x. Okay, so this is a map, phi. And what you want, you want to take, in general, this lives in z2 cube times r2. Okay, and he wants to avoid the preimage instead of z2 to the fourth. Okay, inside here I have z2 to the fourth. I want to go back and remove these points. So I have to compute how many points are here with these conditions that are all integers. Okay? So I first, so let me see which one I have to do. So first I fix v1 and v3 in any possible way, okay? So I get 2r to the fourth, because there are four parameters, okay? Then I fix x in all the possible ways compatible with the fact that it has to be in this ball. So it's integer and it has to be in the ball. So I get two R squared points. Okay, now I have left just one parameter and I have to choose V2. But if you look at this equation here, V2 is on the circle of diameter XV1. So how many points there are on a circle of diameter of order R? Well, V2 can be fixed in R to the delta ways with delta small. Okay? 
So these are the points that I have to remove. And how, how many are there? They are r to the 6 plus delta. How many points do I have in this ball here? Well, wait, I made a mess. Yes, obviously, this is false. Fix r, you cannot fix r in any possible way, I'm sorry. Here I have an equation for r. So I fix one of the components of r and the other one is automatically determined. I was starting to go too fast and then I lost myself. Obviously, I have to use the equations, otherwise I'm done. Yes, <laughs> it's clear. you have to need to. So fix x, fix the first component and the second is given. And so now I am in business because now this is r to the 5 plus delta and my box contains r to the 6 points. So if I take r sufficiently large, I certainly have lots of points that are good. I'll keep playing these games for all the possible combinations and uh, you will get your result that you have no integer intersection points. And you see it's quite easy, I mean it's, uh, but it's not a polynomial. Okay, thank you. Can I just make a minor clarification? In your in the statement on the second board there, um, when you say US is invariant, is that invariant with respect to the NLS flow? No, no, for the H resonant. Only, only the yeah. No, that would be too too beautiful to be true. No. Right. So and um, I I just like to ask, uh, do is there like a, so when you say that is this a polynomial, do you mean you have a constructive algorithm for constructing this polynomial or? Yes. Okay, and. Maybe just last final question. Suppose instead that instead of just a pure power non-linearity, got two different non-linearities of different powers, would your same? Um, uh, that we we try to play that game. Well, if if you use this strategy directly, you will only see the lowest degree because you're just doing one step of Birkhoff normal form, and then it's just the lowest degree that counts. Mm -hmm. But you could try to plug in other pieces. The only problem is that, unfortunately, we were not able to get any better results by doing it. We would have liked to uh, use... So what do you mean by better results? Maybe uh, have... Uh, okay, for instance, in higher dimension, know better the, the corrections, or maybe try to have uh, more non-resonance conditions, because, of course, you might like... T after I've proven linear stability, I might like to go further. And uh, so maybe possibly taking into account more resonant pieces would help me to go further in a, a Birkhoff normal form. But unfortunately, we, we are trying. But, uh, One more question. Okay. If not, let's thank again.